didn't bother me none. He didn't even know that it could even bother him. The feelings behind his life were not allowed to be there. And I thought, wow, that could happen to him and what's happened to the rest of us. So men's work became very important. So now we're 30 years later. We're doing incredible stuff in all the fields. And I'm interested in men who have begun to see themselves as taking initiative of, and deciding that they could stay in places where they have privilege or they could move to the margins and join other ways of being on the margins that are healthier for them than staying in the center. So let me do some slides. So the old adage is that we are born male, but we're made into men in the same way that we're born female and we're made into women. And it's, again, it's incredibly contextual. But I love this slide for those of you who can see it because it's a picture of just the sweetness of men's lives, the beauty of men's smiles, the lusciousness of their joy, the spontaneity of their actions. It's incredibly rich, and it's who we are as men. And it's who the men are that we're working with in whatever that capacity is. But at times, it can get lost. There's an intersection of heterosexuality and masculinity that I think is pretty profound, that we don't raise boys to be just masculine in a certain particular contextual way. Pretty much in every, in, throughout time, in terms of patriarchal cultures, we raise them to be heterosexual with the tenets of heteromasculinity as an internalized identity. We pick it up along the way. It's in the water. We don't think about it. We just do it. Our language displays it. We talk about, about uh, we talk, we look, everything we do sort of is internalized, and so it's not thought out until somebody points it out to us, which is why the work we're all doing, pointing out masculinity to people and critiquing it, saying, so what's that about? Why did you do that? How did that feel? all of a sudden creates an opportunity to stop and think. And once we do that, then we can analyze. So the second tenet is that heteromasculinity is informed by culture, social class, ethnicity. There's no one heteromasculinity. But key to it is that a particular type of masculinity is idealized within a particular context at all times. So how I am as a soldier in Iraq versus how I am when I'm with my wife um, right after having sex is going to have a different way to display my masculinity. It's going to be a different way to be me. Um, I was remembering working years ago with teenage boys and going on a field trip who were in jail and um, going on a field trip with them. And we were coming back from the field trip, and they were sleeping. And these were really tough kids who had been incarcerated for a year or more. And, and they were sleeping. And I looked in the back of the van that I was driving through the rearview mirror, and they were just snuggling all over each other, sleeping away, and they were just the easiest, sweetest-looking angels you could ever see. Their masculinity let, it was still there, but they just had a different form because the context was different. They were sleeping. Um, the third is, so for some men, maybe we could put some to sleep, and, and when we wake up, things will change. So, and then the third tenet is that any particular form of heteromasculinity ceases to be dominant when it ceases to have influence. When the, the male on the battlefield loses his best friend to death and he cries, the old mas the masculinity that might have been shown that moment before ceases to be functional, ceases to be who he is, what he wants to hold on to, and his masculinity turns into a whole different way of being. Both are truly masculine reactions to situations that he's in, but they are incredibly, incredibly um, malleable. And it's a big piece for me to think about our malleability. The tenets of the heteromasculine, as it's been represented historically, has been that masculinity is evidence in the expectations of systematic domination of women and marginalized males, which is pretty much evident if we look at a global scale and historically. Masculinity is expressed as the devalu devaluing of the feminine, um, both the feminine within the self as well as the femininity of others. And the third is that heterosexuality is formed through the demonization of homosexuality, and particularly the homosexual. So even in those cultures where same-sex practices might take place um, among men, it will not be labeled homosexuality, and those people that define as homosexual are, are incredible um, danger. 
I'm interested in the gender processing that we go through as men and what we know from a broad range of studies, this long history now of men's studies that have just really continued to produce a lot of good stuff, is that, and overall gender studies has, and then men's studies has really focused on it, but that, you know, little boys as little boys, at least in the U.S. culture and the studies I've been able to follow, you know, we have a different verbal language, um, tonal language, and body language that we receive as little infants. We talk louder, we talk more abruptly, we say, cute kid, if it's the boy, we say, what a beautiful girl. Tone, body, words, very, very different. Our association with, with, fem, with anything feminine is restricted, particularly as we get into our third and fourth year of life. Masculinity and heterosexuality are seen as unidimensional. There's only one way to be masculine, only one way to be heterosexual. Wrong. Emotional expression is limited. Restricted Im- expressions of intimacy among boys and men is pretty well enforced throughout, throughout the, the, the institutions of, of at least U.S. society. And then competition is emphasized. Relational dependency on females ends up being what happens. Um, and the sensual is located oftentimes in patriarchal culture as something that occurs within the feminine. That, men, that There's a mechanical nature of masculinity that we articulate, that we emphasize and the sensual nature of the human form, the human body, at least in U.S. culture particularly, um, that I know best, is certainly is not represented. So we end up having what we all know. We have high degrees of homophobia, um, sexism, health and quality of life issues come up. There's violence between genders and within. Um, lower emotional intelligence, performance anxieties, engagement in relationships and intimate relationships and families and, and friendships all come into play. Um, Jim O'Neill talked about a lot of that this morning in his work on d- gender strain. All of these cause gender strain. If I walk around being homophobic, sexist, health, don't take care of my health, have <laughs> intense, you know, have low emotional intelligence, like hello, a setup for emotional strain. I have a client, I have a small private practice as a therapist, and I have a client the other day who's 27, it's just a really wonderful young male, and it was raised in a very alcoholic um, household. His dad was severely alcoholic. And he's also a, a, ballet, a dancer, he dances for a ballet company. But I can just see in his body the tension that he lives with, the fear that he lives with about letting himself go. And he's heterosexual. And one of the things that he has always had to confront is that as soon as he says he dances, people say, oh, are you gay? And as a matter of fact, when he became a client of mine, I mentioned to, to two of my colleagues at a, at a supervision session that I had a dance. This guy was seeing me, and he was a dancer, and they said, Oh, I'll bet he's dealing with gay issues. I said, no, he's married. He said, yeah, but you just wait. And I thought how little we have to do to be suspect that we're not normally masculine and not normally heterosexual. So we get these messages, we get, we get this package delivered to us, and then we end up having problems. And we have a difficult time as men, I think, saying there's a problem with our lives and the social arrangements because we've been told for a long time that we're privileged. And you white males are privileged, males are privileged, you know, everybody takes care of males. But the truth is we're not in a way that, that I think we thought we were at the one time. The idea that we get, the, the message we get in the culture of any dominant system is that the system is exactly what it's supposed to be. Male deserve the privileges they have. There's, it's totally a rational system for men to get paid more than women, for men to have charge of households. Um, religion certainly supports it historically. Um, Certainly institutions like education has. Um, it's that, that what we have now is fully desirable, and it's without fault. It's what Anne Wilson Schaaf in her book in the 1980s, actually this is a second publication, a second edition, talks about there is no theology of difference in historic patriarchal cultures. There's a theology of sameness. All men are, and all men should be. So... When I think about that and think about the work of people like Stephen Lukes, who talks about power and its dynamics um, and the ability to control resources, the ability to access vo- to, to limit access to voice, the need to, um, for men to invent their own masculinity because no one's going to give them a menu is a result of a particular type of patriarchy that we have in place, that it serves the status quo, but it doesn't necessarily serve men. So I think the work a lot of us have been on personally as well as, as well as as academics, as, as th- therapists, um, as health providers, has been to try to increase that menu and try to help men invent a different type of masculinity. 
So there's a real need, I think, to re-image uh, masculinity by asking men and inviting men to go to the margins and supporting those who do. Re-imaging masculinity is what we've been doing, and I think consciously doing it is important for us to take that on. Re-imaging masculinity means creating new ways of, of um, new images of, of what it means to be a male, new icons, new language, ways of being male that have moved away from those traditional ways of being. And particularly today, I want to talk about heterosexual masculinity, new ways of being heterosexual and presenting ourselves. So we need to legitimize forms of masculinity that affirm women and homosexuality as an essential, as an essential component of ending men's sexism and homophobia and making a positive impact on men's lives. I think one of the things that we know from some studies that have been done, and I think some that are being reported here, is that as men let go of sexism, as men let go of homophobia, we live better. We aren't afraid. We don't hold on to our emotions. We let go. We breathe. We can do stuff that we couldn't do before. 